We heard this morning that Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that if a man desires to be an overseer, he aspires to a noble task. I want to introduce our next, next speaker, uh, Melton Ledford Duncan Sr., and he has aspired to be an elder all his life. What he's wanted to do with his life is to be a ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church, and as a little boy, he would attend General Assembly of the PCA, falling asleep on the lap of his father, who was one of the founding ruling elders of our denomination. He is the model churchman in these and so many other ways. I'm Rick Phillips. I have the great privilege of serving as senior pastor together with Mel in our church, and I hope you'll welcome him as he now will speak to us out of his vast experience and love about the office of the ruling elder. you have your Bibles, please open them to the book of Titus. This morning we heard from Dr. Master on the importance of the new birth, and we heard from Dr. Gibson on the, the importance of, of ministers being grounded in the Pauline instructions for them. We'll now look to the book of Titus. I want to express my thanks to Dr. John Payne uh, and for this opportunity to speak on a church history topic and his friendship and encouragement in the Christian faith. And I want to also express my appreciation to my pastor, uh, Dr. Richard D. Phillips, a son of Virginia and a door-handed ranger of the North. <clears throat> I want to give you three things to keep in mind as I give you this presentation today. Uh, my presentation is given from the perspective of a ruling elder and a covenant son of the church. As a boy growing up in the 1970s, I did indeed watch my father and many others participate in the continuing Presbyterian Church project. Many of the PCA founding fathers were family friends, close friends, and in some cases relatives, who I enjoyed listening talk about the church around the Sunday dinner table. Secondly, my challenge today is to introduce to you, to some of you, your Christian family, some of whom you may not know, and specifically a theological ancestor that if you've never met, I hope will become a hero of the faith for you. Samuel Miller is the most important Presbyterian many of you may have never read. The Lord used his biblical scholarship to recover the American Presbyterian Church's biblical understanding of church government. And to put it directly, you simply can't understand PCA Presbyterianism without engaging Miller. Thirdly, I want to highlight a theme that flows throughout the Gospel Reformation Network. Every council member, every conference, our emphasis has always been this idea of what Dr. John Payne has called mere Presbyterianism. This idea of promoting normal, biblical, confessional, healthy PCA perspectives on what is right and not so right about PCA public theology. Let me hasten to add that there are a lot of different versions, variations of this mere Presbyterianism that uh, council members have put forth over the years. Ligon Duncan and David Strain uh, have coined the 18 points of the Twin Lakes Fellowship. David Garner has the Southgate Fellowship Affirmations and Denials concerning world missions. Harry Reeder's entire life has been an example of this principle, but particularly his ministry of evangelism and revitalization for local churches is something you should pay careful attention to. <clears throat> when we think about the importance of making our preaching expositional and the necessity of personal evangelism, all of these things flow out of the mission of the church and the ordinary means of grace as our philosophy of ministry. So what is mere Presbyterianism? John Payne has said, if we as presbyters possess a deep humility and a willingness to learn from one another, our different emphases within confessional bounds will strengthen the whole rather than tear it apart. I might not always be comfortable with the way my fellow presbyters apply the Reformed faith and vice versa. Nevertheless, with the spirit of charity and brotherly affection, I could happily serve out the remainder of my days in a denomination where there is a common, earnest, and sincere commitment to mere Presbyterianism a Presbyterianism that is neither narrow nor more broad uh, than our confessional standards permit. 
The problem comes, of course, when PCA pastors and networks are not genuinely committed to mere Presbyterianism. The problem arises when presbyters are more dedicated to progressivism, heterodoxy, or shallow forms of evangelicalism than to the Reformed faith and confession. Movements like these, especially the progressive tendency to negotiate biblical truth for cultural relevance and acceptance, are outside the pale of Reformed orthodoxy. If individuals and groups like these do not exercise integrity and admit to a, a departure from their ordination vows, division will ensue. Gospel proclamation, Reformed worship, confessional integrity, sincere piety, and biblical mission do not constitute a narrow, overly narrow vision of the Reformed and confessional faith. In other words, these points are no TR manifesto. Instead, they form some of the main building blocks of mere Presbyterianism and are designed to foster Christ-centered unity, not division. Therefore, it is absolutely imperative that we renew these emphases in our congregations, session rooms, and presbyteries. So, perspective, discovery, and mere Presbyterianism. Brothers, let's hear from God's inerrant word, the book of Titus. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in the word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father <clears throat> and Christ Jesus the Savior. <clears throat> this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you to, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching uh, for shameful gain what they ought not teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters, in everything, they are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, 
not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, <clears throat> we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God <clears throat> may be careful to devote themselves to good works. <clears throat> these things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him, once and then twice, have nothing more to do with them. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to come to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they like nothing, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to keep cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with all of you. There was an idea. The idea was to bring together a group of, <clears throat> of remarkable people to see if they could become something more, to see if they could work together when we needed them, to fight the battles we never could. Now, some of you may recognize the words of Nick Fury when he organized the Marvel Cinematic Universe's greatest cosmic level fighting force, the Avengers. But they might also have been the words spoken by Asbel Green who, when he brought together the greatest theological team American Presbyterianism has ever resourced, the faculty of Princeton Theological Seminary, and more importantly, birthed the Princeton theological tradition. Together with Archibald Alexander, Samuel Miller, the topic of my talk, became the cornerstone of the Princeton faculty when he formed in response to a report brought from the 1810 Presbyterian General Assembly which stated that there were no fewer than 400 churches without a pastor, without a learned and pious minister for pulpit ministry, and the church had great need. And in response to that, Princeton would be formed, and oh, what it would become. The Princeton tradition would grow to include Charles Hodge and B.B. Warfield and many others before it would end with J. Gresham Machen when the legacy left New Jersey and moved to Glenside and Westminster Seminary. The OPC comes along after that, and then the PCA. Every person in this room, every institution in this room, our churches, our ministers, are the product of that tradition, locally, nationally, 
by God's gracious product, we are all part of the Princeton tradition. Samuel Miller's life prepared him to be a pillar of the Princeton tradition. There are four great epics in his life, each built on one another. He was a child of colonial America, born in 1769 in the middle, of, in the middle American colony of Delaware. You remember that Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware share a peninsula, and that was where Francis McAmey brought uh, the first Presbyterian church in America when he came to us from the middle of a war in Ireland and planted our denomination. He was, uh, Samuel Miller was a child of the manse. Today we would say he was homeschooled. He received instruction under his father, who was a New Englander, the Reverend John Miller, who pastored in Dover, Delaware. Samuel Miller was a college student in the late 1780s. He graduates from the University of Pennsylvania, the class of 1789, with the highest honor in his class. While an undergrad at Penn, he was a first-hand witness to both the organizing General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States, as well as the Constitutional Convention of the United States. One can't help but think that watching these two seminal events, one civil, the other ecclesiastical, was mightily used by God to give him a love for polity and order. You might say Miller discovered Philadelphia freedom. From Philadelphia, he would head to New York, New York, where he had a remarkable pulpit ministry. Simonetta Carr writes that Miller became involved in the intellectual and political discussions of the day, which were as complex as they are today. Although he came from a family of slaveholders, he spoke firmly against the institution of slavery, which he saw as inconsistent with justice. He promoted gradual emancipation in an effort to educate enslaved people and give them tools to thrive on their own. Later in life, however, Miller regretted yielding to the sore temptation of political involvement. At a time when he should have been totally devoted to pastoral care, <clears throat> for though ministers have the rights and duties of citizens, he said, I think I was wrong in talking and acting and rendering myself so conspicuous as a politician as I did. I fear I did an amount of injury to my ministry which could by no means have been counterbalanced by my usefulness as a politician. Words we should all reflect upon today as we opine and tweet and blog. In 1813, Samuel Miller left New York where he had been part of a multi-staff church, we would say today, that ended with some strife and division and he began teaching at the New College in Princeton. He was the professor of ecclesiastical history and government. Simonetta Carr writes that while reflecting on his task ahead and the unusual uh, situation of working again as the number two in a two-man team, he would write a short list of resolutions with what stands out about them is their focus on the task ahead and the tremendous sense of responsibility born of his concerns for God's glory and the men who were to be committed to his cure. He resolved to remember that he was a servant of Christ for the benefit of his students. He focused on his upcoming relationship with his co-workers, remembering that he had come out of a very poor relationship in New York. He said, resolved that I will endeavor by the grace of God so to conduct myself towards my colleague in the seminary as never to give the least reasonable ground of offense. It shall be my aim by divine help ever to treat him with the most scrupulous respect and delicacy and never to wound his feelings if I know how to avoid it. By the grace of God, he added, I will in no case take offense at his treatment of me. In the spirit of these resolutions, he devoted the rest of his life to faithful biblical instruction. From his time at Princeton, some of his most beloved writings came, particularly his letters. In his letters he wrote uh, that, that we have today, he wrote on topics such as suicide, clerical manners and habits, Christian ministry, the eternal sonship of Christ, prayer meetings, and advice to a son going off to college. 
If you have never read Samuel Miller, you should start by reading the work of David Calhoun of Covenant Seminary, the late Dr. Calhoun, now in glory, who produced a magisterial two-volume history of Princeton Seminary. This is a wonderful introduction to the Princeton theological tradition. My friend Jonathan Master tells me that he reads this through every year. Calhoun is a delight to read, and the book is a treasure for the church. Let me also commend the work of Log College Press. I mentioned that to you earlier today. Caleb Cangelosi is here, and his wonderful ministry of reprinting and digitizing old Presbyterian history is a great treasure for the church. I'm pleased to serve with Caleb on the PCA History Center Advisory Committee and commend his ministry to you. You will find in our excellent conference bookstore three copies left of Samuel Miller's addresses and, and lectures that Joel Beakey of Reformation Heritage Books has put together, a remarkable resource on the life of Samuel Miller. Miller was a prolific writer, preacher, lecturer, and author. He was a true public intellectual in the 19th century. Uh, you may even find a book out there that my own father published in 1991 on the utility uh, and importance of creeds and confessions. But it was his books that have brought us the greatest memory and legacy of his memory. His book titles sound almost like a 19th century version of Nine Mark's ministry. Thoughts on public prayer, the Christian education of children and youth, utility and importance of creeds and confessions, infant baptism. Well, no, that doesn't sound like Nine Mark ministry. <laughs> The entire, the entire title is Infant Baptism, Scriptural and Reasonable, and Baptism by Sprinkling or Effusion, the Most Suitable and Edifying Mode. <laughs> A bestseller in 19th century Presbyterian circles. <laughs> uh, Samuel Miller wrote a, a manual for his presbytery. As someone who serves as a clerk in my local presbytery, uh, I found this amazing, and it's a remarkable document. Uh, my favorite book of Miller's has the wonderful title, Presbyterianism, the Truly Primitive and Apostolical Constitution of the Church of Christ. It's an excellent introduction to the idea of Presbyterianism as a biblical mode of government. The main subject of my address and, and what I will limit my remarks to is his book, The Ruling Elder. The Ruling Elder. I want to consider two of the main points in his book, the ruling elder, the necessity of a ruling elder, and the nature and duty of a ruling elder. Samuel Miller wrote, now all serious impartial readers of the Bible believe that besides the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacrament, that the best interest of every ecclesiastical community requires that there be a constant and faithful inspection of all the members and families of the church that the negligent be admonished, that the wanderers be reclaimed, that scandals be removed, that irregularities be corrected, that differences be reconciled, and every proper measure adopted to bind the whole body together by the ties of Christian purity and charity. They consider it as vitally important that there be added to the labors of the pulpit those of teaching from house to house, visiting the sick, conversing with serious inquirers, catechizing children, learning as far as possible the character and state of every member, even the poorest and most obscure of the flock, and endeavoring by all scriptural means to promote the knowledge, holiness, comfort, and spiritual warfare of every individual. Miller believed that the ruling elder was key to the third mark of the church. He believed that the ruling elder was to be absolutely essential to the purity and edification of the body of Christ. He says, as one of the most precious means of grace by which offenders are humbled, softened, and brought to repentance. The good, the church put, purged of unworthy members, offenses removed, the honor of Christ promoted, real Christians stimulated and improved in their spiritual course, faithful testimony born against error and crime, and the professing family of Christ made 
to appear holy and beautiful in the view of the world without wholesome discipline for removing offenses and excluding the corrupt and profane. There may be an assembly, but there cannot be a church. Samuel Miller shows us that the idea of ruling elders is grounded in the Old Testament when Moses' father-in-law encouraged him to appoint elders to assist him in his work. The idea continued into the synagogue system between the Testaments. And lastly, we see it instituted in the New Testament office of elder and the writings of Paul, whose epistle to Titus we have read together just a few minutes ago. Miller reminds us that the pastor's work is endless and that elders are particularly a gift to pastors or ministers. Miller calls the office of ruling elder a divine institution whose commitment to the third mark of the true church, discipline, is strange but necessary. And now the nature and duty of the office. Miller says the essential character of the office of whom we speak is that of an ecclesiastical ruler. He that rules, let him do it with diligence, is the summary of his appropriate functions as laid down in Scripture. Miller says the teaching elder is indeed also a ruler. In addition to this, however, he is called to preach the gospel, administer sacraments, but the particular department assigned to the ruling elder is to cooperate with the pastor in spiritual inspection and government. The scriptures that we have seen speak not only of pastors and teachers, but also of governments, of elders who rule well, but do not labor in the word and doctrine. For those of you out there who love to discuss uh, whether there should be two offices or three offices, uh, and let me remind you the PCA is a two-office church, it's fascinating how both Hodge and Thornwell in later years would both appeal to Samuel Miller's uh, doctrines and writings in support of their particular view of that principle. Miller says there is an obvious analogy between the office of ruling elder in the church and in the civil community. A justice of the peace in the civil realm has a wide and important range of duties. Besides the function which he discharges when called to take his part on the bench of the judicial court in which he presides, he may be and often is employed every day, though less publicly, in correcting abuses compelling the fraudulent to do justice. Strikingly analogous to this are the duties of the ecclesiastical ruler. He has no power, indeed, to employ the secular arm in restraining or publishing, uh, punishing offenders against the laws of Christ. The kingdom under which he acts and the authority which he administers are not of this world, Miller says. The ruling elder, no less than the teaching elder or pastor, is to be considered as acting under the authority of Christ in all that he rightfully does. If the office of which we speak was appointed in the apostolic church by infinite wisdom, it is an ordinance of Jesus Christ, just as much as that of the minister of the gospel. Then the former, equally with the latter, is both Christ's office, officer. He has a right to speak and act in Christ's name, the ruling elder does. Though elected by members of the church and representing them in the exercise of ecclesiastical rule, yet the ruling elder is not to be considered as deriving his authority from them any more than he who labors in word and doctrine derives his authority to preach and other ordinances from the people who choose him as their teacher and guide. Miller reminds us of that great principle in our PCA Book of Church Order that elders are to rule jointly and not severally, and that our power is ministerial and declarative. And as the whole spiritual government of each church is committed to its bench of elders, Miller says, the session is competent to regulate every concern and to correct everything which they consider as amiss in the arrangements or affairs of the church, which uh, which is its charge. In these several judicatories, the ruling elder has an equal vote, the same power in respect to the pastors. He has the same privileges and uh, the same uh, ability to originate plans and measures. 
of carrying them, provided that he has induced a majority of the body to agree with his concurrence. And thus it may be that uh, the ruling elder, by the means of imparting his impressions and producing an influence greatly beyond his own particular congregation, Miller says, may indeed affect the entire bounds of Presbyterianism throughout the world. Miller encourages ruling elders to be the strongest supporters of their ministers. I want to say that again. Miller encourages his ruling elders to be the strongest supporters of their ministers. He says, and as the members of the church session, whether assembled in their judicial capacity or not, they are the pastor's counselors and colleagues in all matters relating, relating to the spiritual rule of the church. So, it is their official duty to encourage, sustain, and defend the minister in the faithful discharge of his duty. It is deplorable when a minister is assailed for his fidelity by the profane or the worldly. If any portion of the eldership either takes part against him or shirks from his active and determined defense, it is not meant, of course, that they are to consider themselves to bound to sustain him in everything he may say or do, say, for example, his college football team preference, whether right or wrong. <laughs> but when they believe him faithful, both to truth and to duty. Ruling elders should feel it is their sacred duty to stand by him and to shield him from the arrows of the wicked and to encourage him as far as he obeys. I think if I have a message for ruling elders in this room that teaching elders would really like you to know and hear, it's that. Love your, your teaching elder by caring for him but also by defending him. Miller chides ruling elders to be faithful in the big things of the church, overseeing the church, to have an eye of inspection and care over all the members, to know them by their name, to know their stories, to know what they do for a job. And for this purpose, he, he encourages ruling elders to cultivate a universal and intimate acquaintance as far as possible with every family in the flock of which they are made overseers. He says they should watch over the children and youth. He said they should especially watch over baptized children. They should uh, offer freely seasonable spiritual counsel. They should put the Lord's claims to their hearts. This is something that ruling elders uniquely are able to do, isn't it? Think in your own life of a ruling elder that knew you and understood your cares and concern that was emotionally and spiritually invested in your spiritual walk with the Lord and at the right time prayed with you or encouraged you or pushed you to pursue God's will, whatever the cost, simply for the glory of God. It is the duty of ruling elders to take notice of and to admonish, to admonish a sins that occur in private in private. Public scandal is a matter of public items but private sin is a matter of private encourage the members of the church to conduct devotional exercises in meetings and ruling elders should feel free to lead them uh, miller says occasionally dropping a word of instruction and exhortation to the people in those social meetings it is also the duty of the ruling elders to visit to visit the members of the church and their family sometimes with the pastor sometimes without him. It is important that the ruling elder instruct the ignorant, confirm the wavering, caution the unwary, reclaim the wandering, encourage the timid, excite and animate all classes to be faithful and exemplary in their discharge of duty, defend their pastor's reputation, enforce his just admonition, and in a word and in every means in their power, promote the comfort and usefulness of his labors. Anticipating many of the grievances that church members often have towards the ruling, elder, uh, ruling elders, Miller has this for members. Christian brother, brethren, every consideration which has been urged to show the importance and duties
belonging to the office of ruling elder ought to remind you of the importance of the duties which you owe to them. Remember at all times that they are your ecclesiastical rulers, rulers of your own choice, yet by no means coming to you by virtue of mere human authority, but in, this, in the name and by the appointment of the great head of the church, and of course the ministers of God to you for good. In all your views and treatments of them, recognize their character and obey them in the Lord. That is, for his sake, and as far as they bear rule agreeably to his word, esteem them very highly. As I bring my remarks to a close, I want to remind you that one of the enduring lessons of Samuel Miller is that he linked the necessity, nature, and duties of the ruling elder to the words of the Apostle Paul, uh, which we read in the book of Titus. Ligon Duncan, a theologian I am somewhat familiar with, <laughs> says of the book of Titus that this was written from an apostle, evangelist, pastor, and theologian, Paul, to a young man who was a church planner and a local church pastor. He wants to help Titus pastor Christian congregations in the context of an immoral church culture, uh, excuse me, an immoral culture, and to encourage those Christians in congregations to adorn the gospel of God, our Savior, in all of life by the way we live. That, in fact, is the great focus of the book of Titus, adorning the gospel of God, our Savior, in all things. The great gift to Titus that Paul gives to him is the ministry of godly elders. Let me end with two stories illustrating the enduring lessons of Samuel Miller in my own church life and family. A few years ago, I was an elder on duty for a Sunday morning service at Second Presbyterian Church Greenville. A young lady came up to me after the service and said she had some questions for me. She was a television producer for the local news channel, a beautiful African-American lady with a young family she was visiting us with her husband. She told me the name of the church she was coming from, and I thought immediately, aha, this is a conversation I'm about to have about the charismatic church or the continuing gifts of the Spirit. But to my surprise, the first thing she asked me was, is how is this church governed? I was taken aback. Her husband had become Calvinistic through, like many of us, the writings of R.C. Sproul. But she wanted to be a part of a church that didn't just understand the doctrine of salvation, but that applied the, the Bible biblically to church government because she had been in bad churches. And she wanted to associate with a church that was Presbyterian. Lastly, I was talking last week with a longtime member of our church who had grown up in the Roman Catholic Church. And he told me that it was the uh, Presbyterianism had liberated him from his experiences in Roman Catholicism because he had seen the authoritarian nature of a bad bishop and a bad pope for that matter. It was in his experience that the Presbyterian Church had firm commitment to doctrine but it was done in a biblical way in which leadership was shared and accountable to other courts. It was not one man. The ultimate lesson of Samuel Miller is that he recovered biblical church government from both the errors of prelacy and independency. And he reasserted the genius of Presbyterianism. That Presbyterian form of government became the operating system for the Princeton theology, something bearing fruit even to this day. There was an idea to be Presbyterian. The idea was to bring together a group of ordinary people who, by the ordinary means of grace, could become something much greater, to see if they could work together in decency and good order to bring about a reformation and to fight the battles of this age. Thank you. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the goodness and the gift of ruling elders. We thank you, Lord, for faithful men who love the church we thank you for the way in which they care for the Lord's house and the Lord's people. They care to see things done in a good and decent and ordinary way. They take care of pastors. They help assimilate new members. They participate in the training of the young people. They watch over the church staff. 
We thank you, Lord, for the gift of ruling elders. And Lord, for those ruling elders here today, I pray that you would encourage them to take up the call that you've given to them to be faithful in their discharge of duty. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.